is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Live from London, this is Global Business. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Jamie Owen. And I'm Robin Dwyer. Our top stories. City centres fall quiet in the UK as the biggest rail strike over pay and conditions for 30 years stops millions of journeys in their tracks. Avoid escalatory steps. The EU's warning to Russia as the row over Lithuania's blockade of goods to Kaliningrad grows. Germany will send weapons to Ukraine for as long as they're needed. A new pledge from the country's chancellor. From the moment they sign their contract with the Ukrainian armed forces, every single legionnaire is, is, does so in full knowledge of the risks. We hear from the foreign fighters who are risking their lives for the Ukrainian army. And Hungary introduces a windfall tax on airlines. Europe's biggest budget carrier tells us it's idiotic. It's the UK's biggest rail strike in 30 years, overpaying conditions. It comes as a cost of living crisis caused by surging inflation risks wider industrial action across Europe. In England, Scotland and Wales, tens of thousands of staff and 13 rail operators have walked out. The strikes are causing major disruption for passengers uh, on Tuesday. More planned for Thursday and Saturday. Belgium has seen several strikes across numerous industries this year. On Monday, a national strike brought public travel to a near halt, forcing Brussels Airport to cancel outgoing flights. Rubbish and recycling collections have also been hit, as have some childcare facilities. Threatening more disruption for airline passengers, EasyJet's cabin crew unions in Spain have called nine days of strikes in July. The USO union wants a 40% pay rise for its lower-paid cabin staff. Hundreds of crew could stop work in Barcelona, Malaga and Parma. And a wave of strikes is expected across France this summer, including in the energy sector. One major stoppage is expected later this week at refineries, fuel depots and petrol stations operated by the oil giant Total Energies. The CGT union is calling for an immediate wage increase due to what it calls unprecedented inflation. Well, our correspondent, Nawid Jabakal, is at London's Waterloo Railway Station. Nawid, the biggest British rail stoppage in 30 years. Will the unions get the pay rise they want? Well, Jamie, if you listen to what uh, the government is saying, then that looks pretty unlikely. Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister of the UK, saying that this rail strike was, quote, wrong and unnecessary. He also said that it simply was not feasible at this stage in time, given the economic recovery from the pandemic, to be able to offer pay rises to most public sector workers that are in line with inflation and the cost of living, like in many parts of Europe, like in many parts of the world, rising sharply here. That's not going to go down too well with the unions who say it's not just the pay issue. They point to the fact that they haven't had a pay rise for two years. Most uh, rail workers and people also others affected like cleaners and, and uh, people who help trains run, even if it's not necessarily those primarily responsible for, for running the trains and the tracks. They also say it's things like redundancies, uh, compulsory redundancies being offered by the companies, which is why they refused those negotiations. It went right down to the wire. But what that's meant for the ordinary public, for millions of people across England, Scotland and Wales today, has been plenty of disruption because what they find is that they've been in, caught in the middle of an ongoing round now that's lasted for months. Information boards empty, platforms without people, an eerily quiet rush hour in Britain. The country facing its biggest industrial action since 1989. 50,000 workers on railways and London's metro have gone on strike. The first of three days of walkouts this week in a dispute over pay and job losses. Last minute talks to avoid it collapsing. As I understand when you disrupt the railway service because of strike action, people get angry and frustrated by that. We also get hundreds and thousands of messages of working people, including 
uh, railway travellers and passengers who support what we're doing. This is due to a shortage of train Union bosses say government cuts of almost $5 billion from London's transport network and national railways are damaging the industry. Officials see it differently, saying the pandemic has meant fewer ticket sales and the sector needs to modernise. It's a feeling of frustration and I almost missed my appointment today in London. Um, but I'm, well, I managed to book another, um, I managed to book the National Express. Of course you should get paid more, you're helping the economy of London to get back on its feet after yeah. the pandemic. So of course they should get paid more. It's probably like a, by an extra five or an hour. That's nothing. Well, we're just been walking everywhere. I haven't got the train. Yeah, two, whatever yeah. It's haven't really gone to places that are further away. It's just more stayed around where we're staying. Yeah, it's hard as a tourist if you want to go further away. But you can't. Both sides blame each other for months of negotiations failing. Unions on one side, companies and government on the other. With inflation set to hit a 40-year high of 11% this year, workers wanted a pay rise of 7%, far off the three being offered. Don't forget, throughout the pandemic, uh, the UK government supported the railway industry to the tune of £16 billion. We kept our railways going, and quite rightly too. We supported our railway workers and their families. We supported uh, the whole industry. It cost every family in this country thousands and thousands of pounds uh, to do that. This is Waterloo Station in London, where tens of thousands of people pass through daily. Today, it's a very different picture. This rail strike's been on the card for months, but there are signs of more widespread action to come, with teachers, nurses and even lawyers planning strikes over pay and work conditions. That could cripple key parts of the economy when it's still recovering from the pandemic. Trade body UK Hospitality says the tourism, leisure and theatre industries will face a hit this week of more than $1.2 billion. For those striking, though, it's the financial hit closer to home that's causing most concern. So this station was actually Europe's busiest uh, for commuters, Jamie, before the pandemic struck. Uh, almost 87 million passengers passed through it each year. The figures for last year, that's 2020 to 2021, fell to about 12 million. So uh, that's the sort of thinking that the government says is transforming the industry and why they say they can't intervene in this matter. But on the other hand, unions say it's because of the lack of investment that's going into the industry and this uh, job losses and, uh, and cuts essentially from the top that's forcing uh, uh, services to really uh, suffer. But looking at what ordinary people here, I mean, uh, I've been coming here for decades and this is the quietest I've ever seen it. And I think that's going to be the bigger the concern for the government, even if it is sticking to its guns for now. It's not just the rail industry. There are other parts of the public sector workforce that are also uh, growing unhappy about their pay and their conditions, including uh, in places like hospitals and schools, which are already uh, heavily uh, under strain. And I think that's going to be a concern because uh, about uh, 40, 50 years ago, some people remember the winter of discontent here in the UK in, in the late uh, 1978 and early 79, when essentially key parts of the economy were brought to a standstill and le that led on uh, immense pressure on the then Labour government and the Prime Minister Jim Callaghan. There are reports, uh, suggestions even that we could be in line now in 2022 for a summer of discontent and for a Prime Minister who's just survived a confidence vote within his own party. That would be something that Boris Johnson uh, wouldn't want to face. Nawid, we'll reminisce about the winter of discontent in just a couple of minutes. Let me just ask you about a bit more about today, because home workers might have thought that they'd escaped all of the rail disruption, but uh, home workers found that Zoom went down today. Yeah, that's right. And many people actually heeding the advice in uh, the run-up to this strike, three days of strikes this week, people being told not to use trains if they didn't have to. Uh, suggestions, uh, this is a train station as well as an underground or metro uh, station here in London. Suggestions that up to 95% of uh, passengers are are not using uh, the tube service here in London today. So numbers uh, down, but many people choosing to work from home. Zoom, the video conferencing app that's become really a household name now, uh, it suffered a shortage in the last couple of hours.
hours it was down. Uh, there was uh, lots of reports on social media, users saying that they couldn't uh, access it, couldn't start video calls or get onto video calls. Now, we have heard from the company in the last hour or so, it said that there was uh, a, an issue with uh, maintenance and degraded service, it said. But in the last 20 uh, minutes or so, it says that it's back up and running. It's not just the UK, but the US and Canada where those outages were felt. But it's particularly important here because of this rail strike. And it means added misery for uh, lots of people who've chosen to work from home. But it does also hark to a wider issue here. Is the world of work changing? Uh, uh, as those figures at Waterloo Station suggested for the last couple of years, perhaps people aren't going to come into uh, major places of work anymore. And uh, that could mean that uh, this industry, the rail industry, that's been central to economic growth in many parts of the world for the last few centuries, may have to uh, look inwards to see how it prepares for the future. Naweed, thanks for that. Our correspondent, Naweed Jabarkal, at London's Waterloo Railway Station. Robert Maisie is from the Trades Union Congress. I asked him if strikes were the right way to proceed, given that taxpayers and workers would take the brunt of the impact. I think the union demand here is, I mean, extremely modest, right? They're asking for a cost of living pay rise, a pay rise in line with inflation, right, which I think is a completely sensible and legitimate thing for any trade union to be asking, and for the defence of safety-critical jobs. You know, when the rail companies and the government talk about Victorian practices, they're talking about getting rid of the ticket offices. They're talking about getting rid of the safety inspections. They're talking about getting rid of the human beings that staff the stations. So I think the interest of the workers here and the interest of the public are very closely aligned. The railways were given billions of pounds to stay afloat during the pandemic. Uh, we still haven't seen passenger numbers bounce back to normal. Do you think that going on strike is a, is a wise way to proceed, given that those who will feel the brunt of it are the taxpayers and the workers who've already been paying quite a steep price? So, yeah, you're quite right. The railway companies were given a huge public subsidy during the pandemic, half a billion of which, 500 million of which, went straight into dividend payouts for privatised rail companies. I think before we talk about the workers' wages, we should be talking about why public money has been poured into private profit. And we are seeing, as I said, fewer passengers using the railways since the pandemics. Of course, they're bringing in fewer revenues. Where do you think the money will be found for what you're asking for? Well, if the money can be found to subsidise private profit, the money can certainly be found to bring wages in line with the cost of living. I want to remember here that the railways are not a business like any other business. The railways are a completely fundamental public service on which the rest of the entire economy depends, okay? So treating the railways to a cost-benefit analysis based on, you know, there's, there's a reason why money was put in during the pandemic, because we cannot afford for the railway network to fail. And by cutting jobs and by cutting wages and by having managed decline, that is setting this public service up to failure. And that is why RMT members are defending their jobs and their interests, yes, but they're also defending the interest of the public and the interest of the industry. And we are seeing strikes not just in the UK but across Europe at the moment. Uh, do you think they're connected or is this just different rows in different countries? Uh, no, I think there is, you know, uh, a connection. I think throughout the last couple of years we've seen almost unlimited government intervention to, prov to protect private private companies to protect private profits. We see that despite the kind of economic crisis, we see profits going up everywhere. And I think it's quite natural that workers all over the world are asking, where is our fair share of this? You know, these are not radical demands being made by unions in Britain or anywhere else. This is a demand for a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. It is just a demand to make sure that workers' share of profits and workers' share of income is being distributed fairly and evenly. So, yeah, I think, you know, workers, not just in Britain, but all over the world, are turning to their trade unions to get what their, you know, their fair share of the money that is being made. Well, with the UK hit by strikes, soaring inflation and the threat of recession, comparisons have been made with uh, the economic chaos of the 1970s. Those strikes were uh, called, as we were hearing, the winter of discontent. 
Professor Stephen Millard is Deputy Director of the National Institute of Economic and Social Research. Um, Professor Millard, welcome. Uh, we're seeing this increased amount of trade union action in all sorts of areas, rail workers, hospital cleaners, bin workers, not just in the UK either. Is everyone going on strike over the same thing? Is the central dispute inflation busting cost of living pay rises? I think that I think that's that's true. It's it's um, inflation has been very high across uh, across Western Europe. It's been driven by the high cost of energy, um, and it's particularly resulting from the the dreadful war in the Ukraine at the moment. Um, but this cost of living issue is is affecting pretty much uh, everybody in Western Europe. So, uh, to the extent that um, uh, unions are trying to do what they can to minimize uh, the fall uh, in people's cost of living, uh, you, you would expect them to, to uh, be making the same arguments. Nostalgia uh, isn't what it used to be. Um, those of us who are older remember the winter of discontent at the end of the 1970s. What do you make of these uh, headlines about a summer of discontent? Well, I, the, I cannot see it being anything as bad as the winter of discontent. I mean, we lost something like 30 million uh, working days in 1979 on account of industrial disputes. Um, the most recent data we have for 2019 was we only lost 285,000, so one one hundredth of the number of days lost to strikes. So even a, a large increase in strikes this year would, would not come close to 1979. The other thing, of, of course, is that unions themselves are, are much, less power, much less powerful and much less numerous than they were back then. Uh, back in 79, roughly half of the of employed workers were, trade, were in the trade union. That's now down to less than a quarter of, of um, workers are in a trade union. When we look at the wider uh, causes of this uh, cost of living squeeze and the resultant industrial action, we are talking about an international oil crisis, we're talking about Ukraine. National governments are somewhat impotent, are they, uh, aren't they, and how they deal with that? Well, I mean, we have a, we have a terms of trade shock here. We are having to pay out more as a nation uh, for things that we import relative to things that we export. Um, and there is nothing that the government can really do about that. But what they can do is they can seek to minimize the cost uh, faced by the poorest members of society, as indeed uh, the recent announcements by Rishi Sunak attempted to do. Can we talk about individual businesses? I mean, realistically, what can businesses do to avoid, to avoid the escalation of, uh, of staff walkouts and industrial action? Well, I, I think uh, the, only, the only way that, that you can avoid this is negotiation. I think uh, it's up to businesses and their staff to sit down and get together and work out what is affordable from the point of view of the business and um, to the extent possible to share what, what unfortunately is, is a hit that everybody is, is having to take. The UK government has said a number of times in interviews today that it is not part of this uh, rail strike negotiation, although that has been uh, argued with by the opposition, uh, obviously. What more should government, national government, be doing to alleviate uh, these crises? Again, in terms of in, in terms of the actual industrial disputes themselves, it's it's not clear that government can do that much. What government can do is is they can uh, support the the most hardest hit uh, households uh, suffering from the cost of living crisis. And again, the, the recent announcement of extra support for the poorest members of society was uh, very much welcome from that point of view. Professor Stephen Millard at uh, the National Institute of Economic and Social Research in London, thank you very much indeed for talking to us. Thank you. Germany's economy will go into recession if Russian gas supplies stop completely. That's the warning from the country's industry associations, which have slashed their economic growth forecast for this year from 3.5% to 1.5%. Germany's energy regulator has unveiled more plans to reduce industrial gas usage to try and avoid critical industries being disrupted if Russia cuts gas supplies further.
Goldman Sachs and The Economist, economists who predicted the global financial crisis of 2008, Noriel Rubini, have warned that the U.S. economy is at risk of recession, stoking fears of a hard landing for the world's biggest economy. The Federal Reserve last week raised interest rates by 75 basis points, the biggest increase since 1994. Breakfast food giant Kellogg's is to split into three new divisions to take advantage of the consumer trend for cereal bars and food on the go. The maker of Rice Krispies and Frosted Flakes, as well as its own best-selling cornflake brand, is to refocus on snacks and plant-based food. The group, which had net sales of $14 billion last year, has been hit by a decline in traditional breakfast eating habits. Twitter's board has endorsed Elon Musk's takeover bid of $44 billion. Shareholders still have to vote on the deal. Meanwhile, former employees at Musk's electric car company Tesla are suing the billionaire for allegedly being laid off without notice. Musk says Tesla plans to cut 10% of its salaried workforce over the next three months. You're watching CGTN still ahead. No escalation on Lithuania. The EU appeals to Russia to tone down the threat as the row builds over goods to Kaliningrad. There's a new agenda for a new world. Accelerating change in almost every part of our lives. It's shifting the norms of how we work. Travel and connect how we think interact and develop it's a new reality a new agenda with me Juliet Mann ever wondered what's the difference between a bear and a bull market where are the cash cows and who are the lame ducks <laughs> And what exactly are black swans, grey rhinos, and unicorn companies? Make sense of it all with Global Business, only on CGTF. <laughs> Global Business Europe. The EU's ambassador to Russia has been defending Lithuania in an escalating row over the transport of goods to the Moscow-backed enclave of Kaliningrad. Lithuania has shut a key rail corridor across its territory in response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Moscow has threatened to retaliate. Well, let's talk now to our correspondent, Stuart Smith, who's in Moscow. And a reminder that reporters in Russia are operating under media laws that restrict what they can say. Uh, so, Stuart, the EU ambassador has been at a meeting at the foreign ministry in Moscow. Do we know what's happened? Yes, Russian media reports that he was there for one and a half hours to speak with two of Russia's deputy foreign ministers. His message for the Russian foreign ministry was not to aggravate the situation any further. The Russian foreign ministry wanted to get across to the EU that there will be serious consequences if normal operations from uh, between Lithuania and Kaliningrad do not immediately resume. And on top of that, uh, the Russian foreign ministry warned that it reserves the right to take action to protect its national interests if that does not happen. Particularly, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs here is concerned that this is a breach of international law, not just the sanctions in general, which it says are illegal, especially sanctions affecting the transit of goods between Russian regions, but specifically it cites a particular agreement between Russia and the European Union that is meant to ensure transit of goods and people between Russia, the Russian mainland, and Kaliningrad, that exclave in the centre in the centre of Europe. But Stuart, the EU is maintaining that, that Lithuania has done nothing wrong. 
Well, that's right. Yes, Lithuania says, and the European Union backs it up here, that it is merely implementing sanctions that were agreed amongst all of the European Union's member states. Sanctions which must be implemented by others, too, in exactly the same way, like Poland, Finland, Estonia, Latvia, if they, too, were in this uh, geographic situation. But also the European Union emphasizes that the sanctions that are being imposed that are affecting uh, rail transit between the Russian, uh, the Russian heartland and Kaliningrad only affect certain goods. We're talking about metals, construction materials. They do not affect things like uh, medicines or food, and they don't affect passengers. And on top of that, this is particularly surrounding uh, rail transport. There are still sea routes available for the transport of goods, and there are still uh, transport by road options available. Nevertheless, Russia has threatened Lithuania with what it calls a serious negative impact. What form could that take? Well, the Kremlin spokesperson, Dmitry Peskov, was saying earlier in the week that because it's so serious, it requires a very deep analysis of what should happen next. He said that any measures or any decisions must only be taken after a few days of decision making amongst all of Russia's uh, ministries. We also heard from the governor of the region. He's been talking about the kind of measures that may include. Economically speaking, he suggested that could be a ban on the import of alcohol from Baltic states. Uh, that, he says, would deprive Lithuania of 300 million euros. Also, potentially revoking any sort of license for Lithuanian railways to move their goods through Kaliningrad. He says that would make Lithuanian exports that had previously used Kaliningrad's rail lines uncompetitive and be a big hit to Lithuania's GDP. In terms of the military threat, which has been vaguely uh, sort of threatened by parliamentarians in Russia's parliament, uh, the Lithuanian defense minister says to the citizens of Lithuania not to worry that uh, it should be the rhetoric of the parliament should be separated from the reality, which is that NATO is, uh, Lithuania is part of the NATO military alliance, which means should any military action be taken by Russia, there would be a joint allied response. The Russian president, Vladimir Putin, was speaking earlier about how he's hoping to reassure the people of Kaliningrad that Russia has their interests at heart. We all know how carefully the whole world and our country are following what is happening in the civil sphere. Yes, there are sanctions, but they are being overcome in different ways. And be sure, they will be overcome. Our army and navy are improving in all their most important elements in accordance with today's requirements. And this improvement will benefit the entire military organizations of the country. There is no doubt that we will become even stronger. The governor of Kaliningrad is reassuring residents there that there will be no shortages of any essential goods, although he was warning that prices may go up. The plan for now is to put on more boats that can take goods back and forth between Russia and Kaliningrad, and that way uh, offsetting any disruption to the railway uh, network. Stuart Smith in Moscow. Many thanks. Chancellor Olaf Scholz says Germany will continue to supply weapons to Ukraine for as long as they're needed. Scholz said his trip to Kyiv last week convinced him that Ukraine's future is in Europe. His comments come as the governor of eastern Luhansk region said nearly all critical infrastructure in the city of Severodonetsk has been destroyed in heavy fighting. Let's talk to the Associated Press correspondent David Biller in Lviv. David, the fighting in uh, Kihansk intensifying, I think about 95% of it now under Russian control. Uh, is this a completely foregone conclusion? What are the possible outcomes? It wouldn't be a foregone conclusion, but it certainly isn't looking good for, for Ukraine. That Even the governor of Luhansk province has said it's getting harder and harder to hold on. Uh, it has said that they're outmanned and outgunned, and this week we saw Russia intensifying its attack on especially the city of Severodonetsk. Uh, more artillery, more airstrikes, and still intense battles in, that, uh, in, in the streets and even in the industrial zone that Ukraine had once held you know, full control of. Now it holds control of that Azot chemical plant uh, where hundreds of civilians are sheltering, as well as the Ukrainian forces. They've suffered uh, airstrikes and, and uh, rocket launchers, artillery, howitzers, everything that Russia can throw at it. Um, the, the Institute for the Study of War said Severodonetsk is likely to fall to Russia in the coming weeks. 
um, but that it would come at a high cost for Russia because they've had to concentrate most of their available troops in this small area. Uh, and it's also, you know, a few weeks is not in line with the timeline that the Kremlin anticipated when this started, nor what it hopes for right now. The, the Ukrainian deputy defense minister said that the Kremlin has ordered its troops to take all of the Luhansk uh, region by Sunday. Uh, a number of foreign nationals have been uh, captured. Two Americans have been uh, detained. What's the latest um, you're hearing from the Russian side on this? The spokesperson for the Kremlin, uh, Dmitry Peskov, he said he confirmed for the first time that yes, they do have these two Americans uh, from the state of Alabama. Um, he didn't say where they were being held, but what he did say, crucially, is that they are not. He does not see them as prisoners of war. He called them soldiers of fortune. And as such, they are not, according to him, entitled to the same protections as, as prisoners of war under the Geneva Convention. Now, this goes completely against what the U.S. has said in the past and what the U.N. Uh, Human Rights Council says about all fighters in this, in this conflict. Um, you know, we don't really know much more about that exact uh, situation with these two fighters, but also another an American was confirmed killed as well today. Uh, that was confirmed by the State Department to ABC News. So, you know, it, it's, it's something that stands to, you know, make this hit home harder for, for, the, for the U.S. And, you know, Biden has said, he said that he's been briefed on the situation. He hasn't been giving direct comments about this, but he said Americans should not be going to Ukraine to fight. And, you know, it's worth rem remembering that uh, the Donetsk People's Republic now has two British soldiers as well as... Uh, sorry, two British fighters for the Ukrainian side and a Moroccan, they were taken captive and they've been sentenced to death by firing squad. Uh, the UK has been trying to, to rescue these men, to get them out of there, but, you know, it's unclear if there's been any progress and, and you know, obviously when these foreign fighters get captured, they face, you know, real risk of, of having uh, disproportionate punishment compared to the, the uh, Ukrainian fighters. David, thanks for that. David Biller from the Associated Press in Lviv. Well, as we were hearing, concern is growing over the fate of two captured American soldiers, part of Ukraine's International Foreign Legion. Two British, as David was saying, and a Moroccan fighter who joined the regular Ukrainian army several years ago are waiting to appeal their death sentences after being convicted of being mercenaries. CGTN's correspondent Michael Voss has an exclusive report on the International Legion. Within days of Russia launching its so-called special military operation, President Zelensky appealed for foreign fighters to come help defend Ukraine. The response was swift, with hundreds of people signed up to the newly created International Legion. I'm just 20 year old kid uh, and I feel that's the right thing to do and we're gonna push Russians back it's gonna take a day month or a year it doesn't matter uh, we are on the right side of the history there are no official figures for the size of the Legion though it's believed to number several thousand in an exclusive interview with CGTN their spokesman told me about their makeup so we, we've had people from really every continent, um, but mostly uh, it's Europeans and Americans. And the, the largest, the most represented nationalities are Americans and Brits. Russia says you're all soldiers of fortune and mercenaries. Well, they would say that, wouldn't they? And they've been saying that since the beginning of the war, but it's absolutely untrue. Our legionnaires are serving members of the U Ukrainian armed forces and receive the exact same pay as Ukrainian soldiers, as opposed to some of the private military contractors that uh, Russia's been using. Two captured American legionnaires were recently paraded on Russian TV while two British and a Moroccan fighter have been sentenced to death, convicted by Russian-backed separatists of being mercenaries. My hope is that those sham trials were simply a way for the Kremlin to increase the bargaining value of these prisoners in view of a future exchange. There's also this question of whether this death sentence is going to deter other foreign fighters and what I wonder what effect it's having on on, on legionnaires I would say very little I would say very little I'll tell you why because the the, the legionnaires that I've talked to um, um, everyone says 
whatever happens, they will never allow themselves to fall into captivity. I've heard uh, so many Legionnaires tell me that um, if they've got one bullet left in their gun, that will be to end their lives. They would rather not uh, end in, in, in Russian captivity. You're not seeing people having second thoughts and saying, mm, maybe not, you know, maybe I, I, I made a mistake. The, well, not to the best of my knowledge. So from the moment they sign their contract with the Ukrainian armed forces, every single legionnaire is, is, does so in full knowledge of the risks that are, uh, that are implied. They're going to the front line uh, to do something that is inherently very dangerous. The International Legion is taking casualties, and the longer the fighting goes on, the greater the challenge will be to attract new recruits. Michael Voss, CGTN, Ukraine. You're watching CGTN, still ahead. Who governs France? After the election, President Macron struggles with the mathematics of no majority. perspectives, new possibilities. Wherever you look, we are there to see, discover, explore. We put the pieces together to find what really matters to you all around the world, all around the clock. Our reporters are at home across the globe. From our headquarters in Beijing, and production centers in Washington, Nairobi, and London. China Global Television Network. Stories from across the globe, reaching people across the globe. CGTN. See the difference. has changed under the pressure of the pandemic. For many of us, life is returning to some kind of normal. As we're adapting to changes in all of our lives, let Global Business Europe be your guide to the new normal. Join us weekdays on CGTN. Facing the unknown is always difficult. In a world in turmoil, it's easy to lose orientation. But when the storms come, we have to see the possibilities. Reinvent. Find new opportunities. Discover a path forward. CGTN. See the difference. Global Business Europe with Jamie Owen and Robin Dwyer. Our top stories. City centres fall quiet across the UK as the biggest rail strike over pay and conditions for 30 years stops millions of journeys in their tracks. Avoid escalatory steps. The EU's warning to Russia as the row over Lithuania's blockade of goods to Kaliningrad grows. And Germany will send weapons to Ukraine for as long as they're needed. The new pledge from the country's chancellor. French President Emmanuel Macron has rejected Elizabeth Bourne's offer to resign as Prime Minister after Sunday's election result saw his Ensemble alliance lose its parliamentary majority. Macron is holding talks with opposition parties, including the leader of the far-right National Rally Party, Marine Le Pen, but they've warned that any support will come at a cost.
Well, let's talk to our correspondent, Ross Cullen, who's in Paris. So, Ross, Macron has rejected the Prime Minister's resignation. How significant is that? Yes, Elizabeth Bourne did tender that resignation today, but Emmanuel Macron, when he received that letter, refused. He rejected the idea that she should be leaving her post, saying we need the government to stay on track and act. And so with that confirmation that she should, will be staying on as prime minister, she probably held a cabinet meeting this afternoon, but not every minister who would have attended such a meeting before the elections attended the meeting today because the Environment Secretary and the Health Secretary both lost their races to be an MP on Sunday. And as per convention, if you are a minister and you run for an MP's seat, which you do not win, then you have to resign your ministerial uh, position. So that's Brigitte Bourguignon, the Health Secretary, and Amélie de Montchalin, the Environment Secretary, uh, losing out uh, from their cabinet position. And now that she has been reconfirmed as the uh, Prime Minister, uh, Elizabeth Bourne is going to be meeting with some of the leaders of the different factions in Parliament next week. We understand, following on from these talks, that Emmanuel Macron has kicked off uh, today. But further pressure on Elizabeth Bourne uh, coming this evening. Uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, the head of the uh, far-left uh, France Insoumise, France Unbowed party, who headed up that big uh, left-wing and uh, green alliance for the elections, he said that she, the Prime Minister, should be put to a vote of no confidence uh, in front of MPs. So he's already called for a general vote of no confidence in the government. Now he'd like to see a specific vote of no confidence in Elizabeth Bourne, the Prime Minister. But talks taking place with opposition parties, as you say, the president's office saying that they're seeking constructive solutions. Has there been any sign of that so far? Yes, Robin, we've had uh, a selection of party leaders at the Elysee Palace, the French presidential office and residence today for talks with Emmanuel Macron. Uh, some positive and some more negative uh, noises coming out of those meetings. The leader of the Conservatives, the centre-right Republicans, one of the grand old parties of French politics, Jacques Chirac and Nicolas Sarkozy, both former presidents from that party. Well, the leader said after his talks with President Macron that there was no way at the moment it was out of the question that his party would go into a uh, pact with Emmanuel Macron's uh, party. However, the Socialist Party leader did say that he and Emmanuel Macron had a fruitful conversation. Uh, there was also a meeting with Marine Le Pen, the leader of the far-right National Rally Party. Uh, that's something that is extremely unlikely for Emmanuel Macron and Marine Le Pen, adversaries in the presidential election runoff. Uh, it's unlikely for them to go into an electoral alliance, a parliamentary uh, pact to Together, but there were some uh, noises coming from the Justice Ministry, uh, Emmanuel Macron's uh, Justice Minister, saying that there's a possibility on a vote-by-vote, policy-by-policy basis, that there could potentially be some common ground in the future if there were policies that were uh, kind of common ground between the far right and the centrists, just as that fruitful meeting between the socialists meant there could potentially be some common ground between the left-wing politicians in Parliament and Emmanuel Macron's uh, centrists. Party. So lots of uh, negotiations going on, further talks to be had as they do try to find a viable government for France. Ross, thanks very much. That's our correspondent, Ross Cullen, in Paris. The Hungarian government has been trading blows with Europe's biggest budget airline after it announced a new tax on air travel to subsidise the rising cost of utilities. The so-called extra profit tax will also be imposed on industries that, according to Prime Minister Viktor Orban, have enjoyed record profits. But Ryanair claims they are still recovering from the pandemic and that taxing them makes no sense. Our correspondent Pablo Gutierrez reports. The not-so-friendly skies above Hungary, the spat between Ryanair and the Hungarian government over a new tax on airline travel has grounded the mood of some travelers. I think I'm really angry about the Hungarian government because what they do about this Ryanair and all other uh, companies, I think it's not uh, fair. The new tax, which will add $11 per airplane ticket, will be applied to all flights departing from Hungary from July. It's estimated that this new levy will generate $210 million this year alone for the Hungarian government. Ryanair called the new tax idiotic, confirming it will pass the fee on to customers. Due to COVID, we announced a loss, I think, of about 950 million, just short of a billion. 
And last month, we announced the second year of uh, losses. We made a loss of 350 million for the year in March 2022. Uh, we're not going to be threatened by some uh, Hungarian uh, minister. The Hungarian government has responded in full force, launching a probe into Ryanair's earnings and demanding an apology from the airline. They're protesting against it because they know it can't be passed on, and certainly not in its entirety. And we in the government aren't simpletons who would just look on if such things happened. We would do something about it. This is why they're objecting to the introduction of the tax. We need to understand this because they are business people. And there's no apology. Uh, we don't apologize to fools. Uh, particularly when they are damaging Hungarian aviation and tourism by levying taxes on inbound visitors and Hungarian families. They should do the apologies, not Ryanair. Fellow low-cost carrier Budapest-based Wizz Air has also criticized the new tax. However, Hungary's biggest airline has indicated it will not pass the additional burden onto customers. We suffered the serious losses during the two years uh, of the pandemic and uh, and we don't have extra profit so it was it was really really not the case some passengers remain sympathetic to the airlines where would this money end up this new tax i think it's all the oligarchs hungarian oligarchs in the pocket pocket uh, mostly critics of this new tax have said that instead of helping the economy it will fuel inflation as more companies will shift the cost to consumers. In May, inflation in Hungary topped 10% for the first time in 21 years. Pablo Gutierrez, CGTN, Budapest. The Nobel Peace Prize presented to a leading Russian opposition journalist has been auctioned for a record sum in New York. The medal was sold for $103 million to an anonymous buyer to help fund relief efforts in Ukraine. Dmitry Muratov, editor of the independent Novaya Gazeta newspaper, who was awarded the prize in 2021, says the proceeds will support children displaced by the war. The Novaya Gazeta was forced to suspend its operations after warnings from the Kremlin over its coverage of Ukraine. The leader of Poland's ruling Law and Justice Party and Deputy Prime Minister has resigned. Jarosław Kaczynski was also the head of the government's National Security and Defence Affairs Committee. He says he's stepping down to focus on the party's preparations for next year's parliamentary elections. The former top business executive has been found guilty for his role in the assassination of Honduran indigenous leader Berta Cathera. David Castillo, the former president of Honduran power company Desarrollos and Genericos, was sentenced to 22 years in prison. Gutheris, who was uh, leading opposition to a hydroelectric dam being built, was killed in her home in 2016. Four-time major champion Brooks Kepka is set to become the latest high-profile golfer to quit the PGA Tour and join the Saudi-backed Live Invitational Series. The former world number one is expected to take part in the second event in Portland in Oregon next week. There's a $25 million prize purse for each of the eight live events, making them the most lucrative tournaments in golf history. You're watching CGTN still ahead. Plants blooming early and unpredictable seasons. What does it all mean for the future of food? We're at Kew Gardens next. Events have consequences. Words create impact. Unprecedented scenes that we saw. Hello, the cleanup operation is now well and truly underway. Parts of southern Europe remain in a state of emergency. Context gives meaning. People make history. Far more than a thousand people have come here today. But authorities are still on high alert. So now we've actually become the border on this road. A complex world demands a comprehensive view. But with the cleanup efforts more or less under control, the economic impact is bound to ripple across the country. There's plastic pollution everywhere. Because the world today matters for your world tomorrow. This is the living area of the crew. The focus is family on future technologies. Well, this is something completely different. The world today, every day on CGTN. 
The agreement is signed. But what is the real deal now the UK has left the EU? For trade, for business, for the city, for ordinary people. Make sense of Brexit with CGTN. Welcome back to Global Business Europe. Australia is in the midst of an energy crisis, and that's led to blackout warnings and a suspension of the country's national energy market. Our correspondent, Greg Navarro, explains. The cold snap that hit Australia's east coast at the start of June gave people something to look at. It's worth the drive up from Sydney. We've come just to see this. And prompted many to turn up the heat. The problem is that most of Australia's energy is generated by coal-fired plants, and about a quarter of those plants are currently offline. They're clapped out. They're old, they're decrepit, they break down a lot. So there's many, many gigawatts of coal plant that is offline for routine maintenance. There's also even more coal plant that's offline after fires, explosions, um, various other problems. Demand became higher than the available supply. That led to blackout <coughs> warnings and states urging consumers to restrict power use. The shortage, along with higher fuel costs because of the conflict in Ukraine, pushed power prices so high the country's energy regulator capped prices to protect consumers. But some generators withdrew their availability from the market, leading to further energy shortfalls. My message to the generators needs to be very clear. Stop putting your profits above people. We want the generators to not game the system and to be investing in putting power into the system when we need it. That's why Australia's energy market operator took the unprecedented and drastic step of suspending the entire national electricity market along the East Coast here because it said it became impossible to operate. Australian energy market operator is clearly trying to control this situation by preventing the price gouging and taking um, control over how much energy generators when, will produce, when they will produce, and at which price. Experts say Australia's current energy crisis is a short-term problem, given that Australia is one of the biggest generators of solar power. The medium-term pro uh, problem is we are ready and able and are building more solar and wind farms, but we're not building transmission fast enough to bring the new power to the cities. Because experts say that lack of urgency in making the transition to renewable power sources is a big part of the reason why the country is currently facing high energy prices and a shortfall in supplies. Greg Navarro, CGTN, Sydney. Our climate is changing, but what does it all mean for plant life and the future of food? Many plants are blooming earlier, leading to unpredictable growing seasons. CGTN's Emma Keeling spoke to botanical researchers at the internationally renowned Kew Gardens in London. As the world warms, we'll need to adjust to more extreme weather patterns. Part of that will involve the conservation of hundreds and thousands of plant species. At the Royal Botanic Gardens in Kew, London, scientists are working with global partners to stop biodiversity loss and develop nature-based solutions before it's too late. Extinction is a natural process. Species evolve and go extinct. But we think the rate at which that's happening is, is much faster than it was in the past. So it's a, it's a concern for us. Kew has the largest and most diverse botanical and mycological collections in the world. So, Steve... Is climate change the biggest threat to plant species? Well, it's certainly a, a big issue, a big global issue, and it's on people's minds. The public is certainly aware of climate change as a threat, but from the species that we've, we've actually assessed uh, for the IUCN red list, which tells us which species are close to extinction, the, the actual dominant threat is still land cover change, so the, the conversion of natural habitat into agriculture and pasture land. The true impact of climate change is hard to estimate, even with modelling, because so many plants are yet to be studied in detail. More resources are needed to gather the data to assess the risk, although for well-known species, scientists estimate 80% of the range could be lost. We're so focused on saving animals, like pandas and tigers, but are, are plants just as much under threat? Yes, when, when we first did uh, an estimate of how at-risk uh, plant species were uh, as, a, as an entire group, we found out that surprisingly they were almost as threatened as mammals, um, which have been comprehensively assessed. 
Um, the, the problem is we haven't actually fully assessed every species of plant yet because there's at least 350,000 different species that we need to get through compared to you know, 5,500 uh, mammals, for example. So it's a different scale that we have to deal with. So, so at Q, what we do in our team here, we're working on techniques to speed up that process. And for the species that we don't know what the extinction risk is, we can actually do some modeling and some predictions yeah, so this is the example of one of the species I was mentioning. This is an, an aloe, mm -hmm. aloe baleae. So this one uh, occurs in Kenya, Tanzania, and it, it, it's in fact threatened by multiple things. So it's, as we mentioned, this land cover change, the growth of the agriculture, but it's also a succulent, so it's mm -hmm. at risk because uh, people collect it illegally in the wild. The thing we haven't calculated yet is how at risk this might be from climate change. So without even taking that into account, it's already endangered. As we've seen with global warming, humans cannot always be relied upon to think about the environment. But there is a possible solution a few miles from Kew Gardens. The Millennium Seed Bank Partnership is one of the biggest conservation projects in the world. It's the worst case scenario backup plan if a species is lost to extinction. And that future is symbolised in one empty pot in the temperate house. A reminder of the now extinct St Helena olive tree. Um, all we have is a photo left of what it once was. Some might say it's just one plant. I mean, why, why do people need to care? So it's like a complicated machine. If we take a little part away from it, maybe it will carry on for a little while, but if we keep taking the, the bits out, that machine might stop working. So until we fully understand how everything works together, it's best to keep things as they are, conserve what we've got, uh, and try to avoid this situation where species are, are lost forever. Dr. Steve Bachman from Kew Gardens, ending that report by Emma Keeling. Now, Kevin Conrad is a leading environmental campaigner and a United Nations champion of the earth. But his path to success started at grassroots level through working on the roads of Papua New Guinea. He tells CGTN all about his first job. My first job actually was going down to the river, collecting rocks, loading them in a wagon and fixing potholes on the road. That was something that we were, we were able to do when I was seven or eight years old. It was fun to do. And we got paid, I think it was uh, 70 cents a week in order to fill potholes. And we had to do it uh, two hours a day. And for me, that was as much money as I could imagine spending. It allowed me to go into town and buy one bag of Twisties uh, every week, which was enough for me. And that was my first job. And it taught me, I guess, basic entrepreneurialism that there was a goal, then I had to mobilize my wagon and I had to go find a cheap source of rocks and I had to put the whole thing together and I got, it, I got compensated at the end. So that was my first job. And to find out more about how campaigners like Kevin Conrad from the Rainforest Coalition started out, you can head to our social media accounts or you can search for hashtag myfirstjob. The world's largest ever freshwater fish has been caught in Cambodia. This 300 kilogram stingray was netted by a fisherman earlier this month in the Mekong River. After being fitted with a tracking device, the stingray was released. Scientists say it's a positive sign of the river's good health. The headlines again. City centres fall quiet across the UK as the biggest rail strike over pay and conditions for 30 years stops millions of journeys in their tracks. Our other headlines avoid escalatory steps. The EU's warning to Russia as the row over Lithuania's blockade of goods to Kaliningrad grows. Germany will send weapons to Ukraine for as long as they're needed. The new pledge from the country's chancellor. And Hungary introduces a windfall tax on airlines. Europe's biggest budget carrier told us it's idiotic. Well, that's it for Global Business Europe. Thanks for watching. More on all of our stories at europe.cgtn.com and do follow CGTN Europe on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. We're on Smart TV apps, Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire and Android TV, YouTube, Dailymotion, cgtn.com and the CGTN app and in the UK on Freeview. Coming up next on CGTN, it's Africa Live. We'll see you again tomorrow, same time, same place. From all of the team in London, it's goodbye. Goodbye.